Enterprise was the fifth live-action Star Trek series. By the time it came along in the fall of 2001, the template had been established. In the Roddenberry, Berman era of the franchise, casts of Star Trek shows were all structured the same way. You've got the captain of the ship as the lead, the first officer as the second lead, the engineer, who was a genius and a mechanical miracle worker, and the doctor. There are more types than just those four, but those four are represented in every show. And when a new Trek series was announced, before they even saw a single frame of the show, Trekkies like myself were primed and ready to judge its characters against those of the shows that came before. You couldn't just like or dislike Captain Archer based on his own merits as a character. You had to rank him to know where he stood among Captains Kirk, Picard, Sisko, and Janeway. Same with T'Pol, Trip, and the others. How would the crew of the Enterprise NX-01 measure up next to those of the classic Trek and TNG Enterprises, or Deep Space Nine, or Voyager? Opinions vary, of course, but for me, personally? Eh. They didn't, really. Overall, I think I enjoyed Enterprise as a series more than I did Voyager, but the characters never really popped for me. It's not that they were bad, really, just kind of flat. The actors were excellent. They weren't the problem. It was mostly the writing and the hazy, yet another Star Trek show fog that soon settled over the series. My pre-existing affection for Scott Bakula did a lot of heavy lifting, is what I'm saying. But there is one notable exception. One of Enterprise's regular characters not only manages to stand out from his castmates, but also shows himself worthy of the legacy left by his predecessors. I'm talking about the chief medical officer of Captain Archer's Enterprise, Phlox. He was my favorite character on the show. Whether you agree or disagree, hopefully you have a few minutes, or maybe more than a few minutes, because I'd love for you to sit back and relax as I tell you why Dr. Phlox is actually Star Trek Enterprise's best character. Phlox was my favorite character on the show almost from the very beginning, and for me that is quite a statement because I will remind you that Scott Bakula is the star, and I've been a mark for Scotty Bax since before I had hair on my face. What is it about Phlox that sets him apart? Well, one reason, one big reason, is John Billingsley, the actor who plays Phlox. In the hands of a less thoughtful or talented performer, Phlox could easily have come across as overly eccentric. But while he's never afraid to lean in to Phlox's quirks and strange qualities, Billingsley makes him a person, not a cartoon character. Billingsley's performance and the writing of the character renders Phlox as the most well-rounded of Enterprise's regulars. Over the course of the show's four seasons, we see him being serious and silly, struggling with experiences we can all probably relate to on some level, and offering us glimpses of his species and culture that seem alien to most of us. And there's another thing about Phlox that got my attention right away. He's not just the ship's doctor. He also fills another established Star Trek character type, the resident alien. Is that show any good? Have you seen it? I haven't seen it. Looks like it might be funny. Alan Tudyk. Enterprise actually has two resident aliens. There's also T'Pol, the Vulcan first officer, but Phlox is more often the one placed in the position of outsider observing humanity. Part of his backstory is that he's a member of a medical exchange program that sends physicians to other planets to live and work and increase knowledge and understanding between species. That's what he's doing on Earth when Archer recruits him to be chief medical officer shortly before Enterprise launches on its maiden voyage. Part of Phlox's role, especially in the early episodes, is to remind the relatively sheltered human crew of the Enterprise that the galaxy is full of people who are not like them and have different physiologies and sometimes radically different cultural norms. As he says to Captain Archer in Broken Bow, the show's first episode, if you're going to try to embrace new worlds, you must try to embrace new ideas. There's also that time in season two where he says to Trip, you must try to embrace my horny wife. 
Phlox's enthusiastic polyamory is another thing that sets him apart from the rest of Enterprise's crew. In that episode, Stigma Trip seems especially uncomfortable with it. Feasel, Phlox's second wife, comes aboard and she is immediately all on Trip's jock. Phlox is like, you lucky dog, my wife seems super into you. You should totally hit that. But Trip says, I was brought up to believe you shouldn't mess around with another man's wife. So Flox is like, fine, I guess I'll sit in the corner and jack off while my wife has sex with nobody, you goddamn square. In a way, Flox is the embodiment of Enterprise's mission. He's a member of a non-human species with biological functions and cultural customs that his human crewmates find unusual. Plus, he is an explorer himself. He's curious, open-minded, and eager to learn. And he's got personality, which... Apparently, he's the only person on this ship who wasn't absent when they were handing those out. I'm kidding. Just having a little fun at the expense of the Enterprise crew, lively and vibrant bunch that they are. They're full of personality. Let's go down the list of all these personalities. Surly Sam Beckett, Spock of Nine, Shoot First, Ask Questions Never, The Hot Nerd, Florida Man... Tommy from Galaxy Quest nailed it. With all that being said, most of the time Phlox found himself deeply involved in the drama of Enterprise, it was due to his role as the ship's doctor. And there's nothing Star Trek writers love doing to doctors more than forcing them to confront ethical dilemmas. I mean, most Star Trek characters are forced to confront ethical dilemmas at some time or another. It's one of the major story engines of the entire franchise. But since Phlox is a doctor, his dilemmas usually revolve around deciding whether or not to play God. And those are always fun. Take, for example, one of Enterprise's most divisive episodes, Season 1's Dear Doctor. Yes, it's the Archer and Phlox do a genocide show. I made a video all about this episode a while back, so I won't go into... Too much detail here, but very briefly, Enterprise visits a planet, Valakis, populated by two distinct sentient species, the Valakians and the Menk. The Valakians are in charge, and the Menk are a subjugated slave class, basically. The Valakians are suffering from a disease that will inevitably lead to their extinction. Phlox discovers that the disease is actually a genetic mutation that affects the Valakians, but not the Menk. He figures out a cure, but refuses to provide it to the Valakians, reasoning that they are destined to die out so that the Menk can evolve into the dominant species on the planet. To interfere in this natural process would be wrong. At first, Archer disagrees with Phlox, but by the end of the episode, he comes around and they give the Valakians a treatment that eases the symptoms of the disease, but is not a cure. Enterprise leaves with the cure to the disease, which they chose not to share, condemning an entire species to death, with Phlox and Archer patting themselves on the back for how ethical they were. Phlox and eventually Archer decide that curing the Valakians would be playing God choosing the Valakians over the Menk. But the thing is, not curing the Valakians when you've got the cure is also playing God. You don't get to not play God in this scenario. So Phlox and Archer ultimately choose to play God in a way that leaves billions of people to die preventable deaths. It's not a choice that I find terribly ethical or heroic. But like I said, I did a whole video about that episode. Right now, I want to zero in on what that choice tells us about Phlox. And what it tells us about him is that he's willing and able to make uncomfortable choices and to stick to his medical ethics, even if it means letting people die who he could save. Does that make him a good doctor? Well, if you're his patient, I guess that depends on whether or not your name is on his can-be-ethically-saved list. Does it make him a good character? Absolutely. There are two more episodes that examine Phlox's ethics, medical and otherwise, that I want to look at in slightly more detail. The first is from late in Enterprise's second season. It's called The Breach. Phlox receives a message from the Denobulan Science Academy that a team of Denobulan geologists needs to be extracted from a cave on the planet Xantorus. 
It seems a new government has just taken power and given all off-worlders three days to get out. When Enterprise arrives at Xantoris, Archer orders Travis, Trip, and Malcolm to head down to the planet and go spelunking in search of the geologists. Meanwhile, Enterprise picks up a distress call from a damaged ship. Archer has the injured occupants brought on board, and later he goes to sickbay to see how things are going, and Phlox tells him that one of the people from the ship is in bad shape after heavy radiation exposure. Archer's like, is he going to be okay? Phlox says, yeah, probably, after I regenerate his cells or whatever. The patient wakes up and asks what happened. Archer is in the middle of telling him when the patient sees Phlox and is like, whoa, who's that? What's he doing here? Archer says, that's the doctor. And the patient is like, oh, okay, in that case, I'd rather die. Phlox and Archer have a little sidebar in the hallway where Phlox explains. He says, okay, so that guy in there is an Antaran, and Antarans in my species, the Denobulans, are bitter enemies from way back. We've gone to war a bunch of times. Archer's like, recently? And Flock says, no, like 300 years ago, but we still super hate each other. And the thing is, because of my medical ethics, if the patient refuses to consent to treatment, there's nothing else I can do. Archer says, can't you just knock him out and give him the life-saving treatment? And Flox is like, but my medical ethics. So once again, the captain and the doctor find themselves in a familiar impasse where Archer says, hey, I want you to help that sick person. And Flock says, nope. Returning to sickbay a little later, Archer speaks with the reluctant patient to try and figure out why he hates Flox so much that he's willing to die. The patient says, look, I'm sure he's a great doctor, but his people and my people don't even talk anymore. I'm the first Antaran to even see a Denobulan in six generations. They killed 20 million of us. That's it? Dude, I'm sorry, I know to you that's a lot, but I'm from Earth, okay? We used to kill 20 million people over, like, one Archduke being assassinated. To you, it's a multi-generational trauma, but to us, it's a rough couple of years. Maybe get over it? That's not what he says. Actually, he goes to Phlox and says, So, hey, how come you didn't mention that your people killed 20 million of his people, which is apparently a lot? Phlox says, I mean, I'm not exactly proud of it. My people have tried to put all that behind us, but you can see there's still a lot of bitterness. And Tarans are taught from the time they're children that the Nobulans are to be hated and feared. And sure, we might occasionally choose to withhold readily available medical treatments from an entire population on the verge of extinction to avoid violating our professional ethics, but on the whole, we're a pretty okay bunch. Archer's like, well, just go talk to him. See if you can persuade him to let you treat him. Flock says, fine, I'll go talk to this jerk ass. So he goes back to sickbay and tries to start some small talk with the patient who hates his guts. And the patient says, why do you want to save me anyway? Do you think if you save me, it will erase the guilt you feel for killing millions? And Flox is like, I haven't killed millions. Directly. The patient starts pouring it on now. He says, I bet the reason you're so sure you can cure me is because you know everything about my anatomy from the experiments your doctors used to perform on us, huh? And hey, do you have kids? Did you tell your kids spooky bedtime stories about the evil, hateful Antarans? What would your kids think if they knew you were even talking to one of us? That strikes a nerve. Flox gets pissed, says, I've tried to be nice to you, but you're the ones who have kept this hatred alive. I don't have to listen to this. Good day, sir. Flox has a brief heart-to-heart -heart in the mess hall with T'Pol, well, heart-to-brain in this case. He tells her about how, when he was a kid, he wanted to go camping on a nearby planet, but his grandmother wouldn't let him go because Antarans used to live there and had tainted the planet. When Phlox was older, he took his children to that planet because to hell with his racist grandma. Phlox tells to Paul he was determined not to raise his children the way he had been raised. To Paul says that his children are lucky to have a father who taught them to be open-minded about other cultures. And this also strikes a nerve. Visibly upset, he tells to Paul, I certainly tried. 
Phlox goes back to sickbay to talk with his Antaran patient one last time. He says, I did hear stories about evil Antarans when I was a kid. My grandmother told me, but I didn't pass those stories on to my children. When they asked me, I told them the truth, how the Denobulans had carried out military campaigns against your people, how we had demonized you, made you a faceless enemy. I wanted to teach them to make up their own minds rather than be led by propaganda. Phlox tells the Antaran that he has five children, and they consider his grandmother's racist attitude to be archaic. All of them, that is, but Metis, Phlox's youngest son, who unfortunately embraced those old attitudes. I told Metis I wouldn't tolerate those values, Phlox says. It created a rift between us. We haven't spoken in ten years. Phlox tells the Antaran that Metis would probably be happy to let him die, but that is not the example I tried to set for my children, Phlox says. Why not live and set an example for yours? The patient is moved by Phlox's story and consents to treatment. Meanwhile, the away team has succeeded in finding and rescuing the team of Denobulan geologists. They arranged to leave the Xantora system on the same transport ship as the Antaran, with both sides seeming willing to try and put the old conflict between their peoples behind them. That's a hopeful note to end on, but the episode isn't quite over yet. In the final scene, Phlox begins recording a letter to Metis. His experience with his Antaran patient has encouraged him to try to reach his estranged son one more time. So once again, we see that Phlox is perfectly willing to not provide life-saving medical treatment if providing that treatment would conflict with his ethics. Now, this case is a lot easier to accept than the one we see depicted in Dear Doctor. Patient consent is an important principle in real-life medicine. It's not hard to imagine an actual doctor handling a similar situation the same way Phlox does. If the patient is of sound mind and refuses treatment, that's it. It's up to them. But we also see that in this case, abiding by his ethics isn't easy for Phlox. He clearly wants to treat the guy. He's just not willing to force the treatment on him. The fact that the patient is Antaran only makes things even more uncomfortable for Phlox. While Phlox has rejected the old prejudices and tried to teach his children to reject them, his behavior in the episode also suggests that he isn't exactly comfortable thinking or talking about the Antarans and their history with the Denobulans. He doesn't want to vilify the Antarans, but they don't seem like his favorite topic of conversation either. And I get that. I wouldn't welcome being reminded of my racist grandma or racist son. A lot of you can probably relate to Phlox in this episode. I know I can. Like Phlox, I was raised in an environment where I was surrounded by casually racist people, relatives of mine and other adults who routinely demonized, demeaned, and othered those of different races, religions, or cultural backgrounds. Like Phlox, I've rejected those attitudes and done my best to not allow those ugly, ignorant prejudices to influence my beliefs and my judgment, but like Phlox, I've also had to recognize that no matter what I do, I'll always be a product of that environment and those people. And if I want to continue to fight against those prejudices I was raised with, I can't ever forget that. The next episode I want to talk about examines Phlox's ethics from a different angle. This time, instead of putting him in a situation where he feels compelled to withhold medical treatment from someone, the story has Phlox pursuing a treatment that will save one person's life, but only at the cost of another's. It's a show from Enterprise's third season, titled Similitude. The episode begins with Captain Archer speaking at a funeral. The camera does a slow pan around the room. We see the assembled crew, and finally, we get a shot of the coffin, and the person being funeraled is... <gasps> Trip! I wonder how he died. Attacked by an alligator? Skull caved in by a breaching stingray? Decapitated while attempting to jumpstart a helicopter? Face eaten off by a bath salts cannibal? Not that it really matters in the long run. As soon as you see who's in the coffin, you know something's up. This isn't gonna stick. 
There's no way they're killing off Trip. <laughs> anyway, after the credits, we jump back to two weeks before the funeral, where we find Trip talking about this thing he's getting ready to do to the engines while giving a foot rub to T'Pol in sexy Vulcan pajamas. That's Okay, he's going to do the thing to the engines later, not while he's giving T'Pol the foot rub. He's just talking about it during the foot rub. And T'Pol is the one wearing the sexy Vulcan pajamas, not Trip. Just wanted to clarify that sentence. Trip does his thing to the engine, and at first it works pretty good, but then Enterprise runs into this super magnetic nebula and the engine goes all kablooey. Trip is injured and taken to sickbay where Phlox discovers that he has serious brain damage. Trip has serious brain damage, not Phlox. At least I don't think Phlox has serious brain damage. If he does, the fact that he's such a great doctor is even more impressive. So things are looking good for Trip, but Phlox tells Archer about a possible solution. Phlox tells Archer, So it just so happens that I have this magic breast implant in a jar on my desk, and if you squirt someone's DNA into that breast implant, it will grow into a clone of that person that will go through that person's entire life cycle in 15 days. I think we should squirt Trip's DNA into it, and then when it's old enough, I can cut out part of its brain and do a transplant to fix the damaged parts of Trip's brain. What do you say, boss? Archer's like, the brain surgery won't kill the clone, will it? Flock says, no, the surgery isn't risky to the clone. He'll be fine and able to live out the rest of his 15-day lifespan. Good, Archer says, because once that magic breast implant turns into a clone of Trip, it'll basically be a member of the crew. And in Starfleet, we don't kill members of our crew for our own convenience. At least not yet we don't. So Flox takes some of Trip's DNA and he squirts it into the breast implant, and the breast implant turns into a baby. Phlox names the baby Sim, and Sim grows up so fast you'd think his parents are Counselor Troy and Tinkerbell. In like a week, he's aged into a full-grown Trip. As he matures, he not only resembles Trip physically, he also acquires Trip's memories and Trip's feelings, including the hots Trip has for T'Pol. With Sim about halfway through his two-week life cycle, Phlox calls Archer to sickbay for some bad news. It turns out magic breast implant clones made from human DNA are a lot wimpier than other kinds, so Sim will not survive the brain harvesting surgery as originally thought. When Phlox and Archer inform Sim, Sim reveals that he's done some research of his own and discovered reports of an experimental enzyme that could slow down his aging process and allow him to live a normal human lifespan. Phlox waves off the possibility, saying that there's very little evidence the enzyme in question would actually work, but even without it, Sim isn't willing to sacrifice himself to save Trip. Later, Archer discovers Sim staying in Trip's cabin, and he's like, Hey, I know you have Trip's memories, but you're not him, okay? You're the guy whose skull we're going to crack open to save him. And Sim says, I am saving Trip by saving myself. I mean, if I refuse the surgery, it's not like you're going to march me down to sickbay at gunpoint. It's funny. You are a lot like Trip, but you're also starting to remind me of someone else. You're bluffing. I know you. You're not a murderer. You sure about that? Sim considers an escape attempt, but changes his mind and decides to go through with the procedure. He even gets a goodbye kiss from T'Pol. I guess she figured he's going to be dead soon anyway, so what the hell? Sim reports to sickbay, says to Phlox, you were a damn good father. To which Phlox replies, you were a damn good son. We skip the scene where Phlox then lasers off the top of his damn good son's head and digs out a hunk of his brain with an ice cream scoop so he can give it to Trip. I am guessing on some of the details. Instead, we cut from sickbay to the funeral from the start of the episode, which, as we all figured out as soon as the premise became clear, is Sim's funeral. Archer finishes his eulogy, and then Phlox, Travis, Malcolm, and some other dude load Sim's torpedo coffin into the launcher for the traditional Star Trek II burial at space. Trip, looking fully recovered, is standing right there. He can't even be bothered to be his own pallbearer. Sim was him, and that him saved his life. Although, 
Maybe Trip found out about T'Pol kissing Sim and refused to carry his coffin out of spite. I can respect that. Whatever, the video is not about Trip, it's about Phlox. And what does this episode's similitude tell us about Phlox? That he's willing to grow a spare Trip in order to get parts to save the original one? Yeah, but it's not that simple. Phlox seems fully aware of the troubling moral implications of the procedure when he pitches it to Archer, but he's also expecting that the clone will be unharmed by the surgery needed to obtain the neural tissue, and that the clone will be able to live out its natural, albeit very brief, lifespan. The ethical dilemma is initially about bringing a sentient being into existence for the sole purpose of having an organ to transplant into another pre-existing being. It becomes about sacrificing one being to save another when Phlox realizes the clone won't survive the surgery after all. Because the episode is about Sim, the clone, and not Phlox, we never really deal with whether or not Phlox would have forced Sim to submit to the surgery against his will. Doing that would certainly be a breach of his previously established ethics, but that doesn't mean he wouldn't do it. Phlox does decline to mention the experimental enzyme that could extend Sim's life, so it's obvious that his priority is using Sim to save Trip, but that doesn't mean he completely disregards Sim's right to be treated as a person. When Sim is a baby, Phlox cares for him just as any parent would care for an infant. Phlox sees to Sim's education as he matures, enlisting Hoshi to help Sim learn to read, even though if I understand Sim's biological and neurological development correctly, teaching him to read isn't necessary, because he will eventually know everything Trip knows anyway. Perhaps most fundamentally, Phlox gives Sim his own name. Yes, that name is Sim, which feels reductive, but it is his own name, and represents at least an attempt on Phlox's part to show that Sim has value as an individual in his own right, not merely as an organ donor for Trip. Sim is an organ donor for Trip, there's no getting around that, and if Phlox wouldn't have forced Sim to undergo the surgery, whether he wanted to or not, Archer makes it clear that he would have, but despite that, Phlox still treats Sim with kindness and compassion, and seems genuinely moved when, at the end, Sim tells him, you were a damn good father. When Phlox returns the compliment to Sim, it feels sincere and meaningful to them both. There's an earnestness to Phlox, a genuine emotional core that John Billingsley always seems able to find. Usually, Phlox is the calm, reasonable one. He's there to provide his mostly human crewmates with an alternative point of view, to push them to think outside the box and be open to doing things differently. It's not that he doesn't have feelings, he just doesn't allow himself to be ruled by them. He's in control. Usually. One of Enterprise's Phlox-centered episodes shows us Phlox grappling with the loss of that control. It's another show from Season 3, Doctor's Orders. The crew detects an anomaly directly ahead on their current course. Going around would add two weeks to their journey, which is unacceptable because this is the season where their mission is to find and destroy the weapon the Zindi are building to launch another attack on Earth. And taking two more weeks to get there would mean giving the Zindi two more weeks to finish and launch the weapon. And that would be bad news for Earth because this Zindi weapon is powerful enough to destroy the entire planet, unlike the prototype which attacked at the end of Season 2 and thankfully only damaged Florida. Damaged. <laughs> I know, I know, the first Zindi weapon cut a swath of destruction from Florida to Venezuela and seven million people were killed. My heart goes out to those seven million fictional people and their families, but it's not like I'm going to allow their imaginary tragedy to stop me from making fun of Florida. Come on. However, they're just jokes. People of Florida, I don't mean nothing. And just to show that I'm only kidding around, I'm now going to observe a moment of silence so that we can all pay our respects to the Florida state flag. Since going around the anomaly isn't an option, Enterprise will have to go through. But 
That's a problem because this anomaly is a trans-dimensional disturbance, and being in one of those is really bad for human brains. So the plan is to put everyone into medically induced comas for the four days it will take to cross the anomaly at impulse speed. Trip doesn't want to risk engaging the warp engines in a region of space with strange and unknown properties, and you call yourself a son of Florida. While everyone else is comatose, the ship will be maintained by Phlox, whose denobulan brain is immune to the effects of the transdimensional disturbance. So Phlox gets a crash course on how to operate the helm and monitor the engines, then puts everyone to sleep and gets started on his awesome four-day vacation of watching movies in the mess hall, strutting through the ship stark naked, and hanging out with Archer's dog. Damn, I bet Phlox wishes Earth was threatened with annihilation by a species that lives in the galactic Bermuda Triangle more often. Unfortunately, it's not all nudism and Danny Kaye movies. Two days in, Phlox begins hearing strange noises. He goes down to the launch bay to investigate and discovers a chain being rattled by some venting steam. He breathes a sigh of relief and says to Porthos, who is with him, Now don't you feel foolish. Then he turns around and, Ah! Jesus Christ, Denise! T'Pol is still awake too, then. Flux did say the anomaly affected human brains, and T'Pol is Vulcan, and the only other non-human besides Flux and Porthos on the ship, so it makes sense. I guess. T'Pol is like, you okay? And Flock says that he's fine, he's just had a little bit of a headache since they started crossing this anomaly. They each go back to their separate duties, but Flox keeps hearing odd sounds and catching glimpses of things out of the corner of his eye. He talks about it with T'Pol at dinner and decides that he must have been imagining it. Since Denobulans are naturally extremely social people, the solitude of having almost the entire crew asleep for the last few days has been stressing him out. Phlox continues hearing and seeing things. He thinks he sees a gremlin or something crawling on the outside of the ship. T'Pol assures him that sensors indicate there's nothing out there. He's making his rounds, checking on the sleeping crew members, walks into Hoshi's cabin, and holy shit, Negrath? I guess all those people who complained about Star Trek ripping off Babylon 5 were right. Phlox is like, hey, you go back to your own series. Hoshi's trying to sleep, so stop bugging her. Phlox calls to Paul and tells her there are Zindian sectoids aboard, and since it's not safe to wake up anyone else, they've got to handle it themselves. Paul's not into that, though. She tries to tell Phlox that there are no unexpected life forms aboard, but Phlox is not having it. He grabs a gun and sets about clearing the ship deck by deck. He picks up something unusual on his scanner, catches it as it comes around the corner, shoots, and misses Porthos, who completely no-sells the fact that he just came within an inch of being barbecued and trots right up to Phlox and to Paul like it never even happened, because he's either that oblivious or that much of a boss, and with dogs, who can tell? T'Pol is like, you almost shot the captain's dog, time for bed. But Phlox hears Hoshi calling him on the intercom and rushes back to her cabin to find her taking a shower and looking not great. Phlox stumbles backward, turns, and sees Hoshi, looking like her normal self, asleep in her bed. Monster Hoshi is gone. Another hallucination. Phlox thinks, okay, maybe I should take a nap, and heads to sickbay. On the way, he runs into Captain Archer, who seems concerned about Phlox's reports of Zindi on the ship, but you know it's got to be a hallucination because he never even mentions the fact that Phlox just almost killed his dog, and the real Archer would care about nothing but that. Dude almost told an entire planet to fuck off in Season 2 because they got pissed about Porthos pissing on one of their sacred trees. He'd start a war for that dog. And I don't mean that as a criticism. It's the most relatable thing about Archer, if you ask me. When my cat was alive, if someone had threatened or even disrespected her, I would have gone full William Money on their asses. Archer will brag to aliens about how humans have overcome the need to solve their problems through violence, but if one of those aliens fucks with his dog, T'Pol will have to talk him out of murdering them all from space. I respect that. 
More than I respect Trip for refusing to be one of Sim's pallbearers out of spite because Sim kissed to Paul even. And that is a lot. Anyway, Phlox goes to sickbay with T'Pol, and he says, Okay, so it turns out this region of space is affecting my brain too, so I'm gonna knock myself out and let you look after things on your own until it's time to wake everyone up. But T'Pol says, Oh, no, you can't do that, because the thing is, this region of space is also affecting my brain, and I'm this close to totally losing it. So they decide to tough it out together for the last few hours. Then they head to the bridge, expecting to find that Enterprise has cleared the anomaly. Instead, T'Pol checks the long-range sensors and discovers that the anomaly has expanded while they've been inside it, and it will now take them another two and a half months to cross it. Unless, that is, they use the warp drive, which Trip wasn't too keen on doing. Phlox decides they have to risk it. He heads down to engineering and starts up the warp engines, checking his work against the online manual just to make sure he doesn't blow the ship up. He hallucinates Trip, yelling at him that he's going to screw it up and kill everybody. Meanwhile, T'Pol stands around, being no help whatsoever. Finally, after much yelling and scrambling back and forth, they get the ship up to warp 2 and fly clear of the transdimensional disturbance. Phlox wakes up Captain Archer wakes up Trip, and is on his way to wake up more members of the crew when he turns to T'Pol and says, Hey, I can take care of this myself. Let me walk you to your quarters and you get some rest. They get to T'Pol's quarters and they're chit-chatting, and then Phlox happens to look over at the bed and sees T'Pol lying there in her medically induced coma. Phlox turns back to the T'Pol he'd just been talking to, and she's gone. Ah? Ah? The old she-was-dead-all-along twist. Or in a coma all along, in this case. Remember when it seemed like every third or fourth movie or TV show was doing some variation on that twist? We all really enjoyed The Sixth Sense, didn't we? Doctor's orders lets us see Phlox's lighter side. He does his Austin Powers naked walk. He chases Porthos around. He reacts to a couple of jump scares. But... It also shows us what it looks like when that comical panic deepens into genuine dread. And crucially, when Phlox is so scared he can hardly move when he's absolutely dead serious, he's just as credible as when he's the silly guy. He has more emotional range than any other character on the show. He can be played for laughs. He's eccentric. He keeps a small zoo of exotic creatures in sickbay. He can puff out his face and do a CGI smile but he can also effortlessly carry heavy, dramatic scenes. Pair that broad emotional range with how multifaceted Phlox is as a person. We see him as a physician, as a counselor, as a husband, as a parent, as a teacher, and as one with an insatiable longing to learn and explore. And hopefully you can start to see why I say he's Enterprise's best character. If you didn't already agree with me, that is, which maybe you did. I knew there was something I liked about you. As for where I would rank Phlox compared to the Doctors from other Star Trek shows, well, that's not what this video is about. But I did kind of bring it up at the start, didn't I? Hmm. I'd place him pretty high, you know. Maybe as high as second? Behind only Bones from Classic Trek? He's a really terrific character. Terrific enough that when I watch Enterprise, it often feels like he's carrying the show. It's remarkable what a difference it can make to a mediocre series to have one character that you're always interested in watching, no matter what else is going on. I said one character, Panama City. Keep your shirt on. Hey folks, hope you enjoyed this one. I'm going to let you know what the subject of the next Trek Actually video is going to be, but before I do that, I want to give shout outs to some of my newest Patreon patrons and channel members. First, the new patrons. They are Shelly Netzer Edgerton, thank you Shelly, Vigo the Carpathian, thank you Vigo, Gunner, thank you Gunner, Austin Lloyd, thank you Austin, Keen Spears, thank you Keen. Michael Anthony, thank you Michael. John Adams, thank you John. Christopher Briggs, 
Thank you, Christopher. Anime O G E K. Thank you, Anime O G E K. Next, new channel members. They are Gene Henry Lindgren. Thank you, Gene. And Mike Spur. Thank you, Mike Spur. If you want to support this channel, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash Steve Shives or clicking the join button to become a member of this channel. All patrons and members get access to exclusive posts that allow you to vote in the polls that determine upcoming Trek Actually topics and also submit questions ahead of time for my twice monthly Ask Away live streams. If you pledge $5 a month or more on Patreon, or become a member at the 5 bucks a month tier or higher, you get a shout out at the end of a Trek Actually video. If you'd rather give a one-time gift than a recurring monthly contribution, you're always more than welcome to do that by clicking the thanks button right below the video, or via PayPal or Venmo. The links for those are in the video description. Many thanks. If you like what I do on YouTube, especially the Star Trek related stuff, you should also check out my side projects. The Ensign's Log, the Star Trek themed comedy podcast that I'm on alongside Jason Harding and Dana Cole, and Trek Reluctantly, the watch along stream Dana and I do every Wednesday starting at 6 p.m. Eastern on this channel right here. As always, links in the description. And now, to next month's Regulation Trek Actually topic. Once again, my patrons and members have chosen, and once again, they have chosen wisely. In fact, they have chosen to let me start the new year off right by giving me an opportunity to gush about the best Star Trek show currently in production. The best Star Trek show of the century so far, as a matter of fact, Star Trek Strange New Worlds. But more specifically, it's an opportunity to gush about the centerpiece of that excellent show, the incomparable lead of its exceptional ensemble. Join me next month when the topic will be why Christopher Pike is actually the ideal Starship Captain. That's next month. I'll be back then and a bunch of times before then. So until the next time you see me, whenever that is, thanks for watching and take care, everybody.